Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends, and welcome to this ESICM webinar devoted to the safety of oxygenation and ventilation in the critically ill patients. I am Katia Donadello, and I work as an intensivist in Verona, and I have the pleasure to moderate uh, this uh, webinar with uh, Tai Tam. Hi, I'm Tai Tam. I'm a physician intensivist in Kamla Bitted near Paris in France, and it's a great pleasure to co-moderate this uh, webinar with you. <laughs> so we will uh, um, distribute uh, all the information of today's webinar in three different presentations, and we have the pleasure to welcome three great intensivists that devote their time and efforts in providing care in patients uh, to patients that need oxygenation and ventilation. I might ask to all the audience to be prepared to provide us uh, all their doubts and questions uh, in the chat box uh, that is uh, available while uh, um, attending uh, to this uh, webinar. We might start with the first presentation. The first presenter will be Professor Audrey Dejean. She's an anesthesiologist and intensivist in Montpellier, France, working with uh, Professor Tania Jadet. She's worked a lot in the operative room and the, the ICU, and her research uh, has uh, focused on the aware and ventilation management, perioperative ventilation, and obesity. And it's a great pleasure to have her as a speaker starting now. Audrey, welcome. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's also a great pleasure for me uh, to, be, to be here. And uh, we're going to talk about the safety of ventilation in 10 gold rules. Here are my links of interest. So first, um, I want to, to say that we just published a recent uh, review, a narrative review on uh, intensive care medicine. And in the, in the recent narrative review, we detail all uh, what we are going to, to say uh, today in this short presentation. So there are two main complications of intubation. Since uh, 2005, uh, it was shown by the Professor Jabertin that the two main complications of intubation in ICU were hypoxemia on the one hand and hypotension. Recently, we had a very nice um, study that assessed, again, the peri-intubation events in critically ill patients from 29 countries and they revealed that also in 2020, the two main complications of intubation were this time first hypotension and then hypoxemia. So we want to prevent those two complications. The two aims of, the, of a successful intubation are no hypoxemia and no severe collapse when performing intubation. So to avoid hypoxemia, the first step is a good pre-oxygenation. The standard pre-oxygenation, as you can see in the picture, is a pre-oxygenation with standard face mask. We can improve further on this pre-oxygenation, as it was shown by Professor Bayard and Jabert in 2006, using non-invasive ventilation. So you can connect the mask to the ventilator, put a pressure support and a peak, about five and five, and then improve the oxygen reserves of the patient and then decrease the occurrence of desaturation during intubation process. These results were confirmed in the very nice uh, French randomized controlled trial, which compared non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal oxygen, both for pre-oxygenation and apneic oxygenation. If in the overall population, they found no difference in the lowest SpO2 during intubation, in the selected population with a PO2 and the MPO2 ratio under 200, so a moderate to severe hypoxemia, they found a difference and the SpO2 value was lower in the high flow canal nas nasal cannula oxygen therapy compared to the non-invasive ventilation group. So finally, we can say that for pre-oxygenating the patient, using a pressure support and the peak, 
is better than using high flow nasal oxygen alone in hypoxemic patients. So what about combining the two, non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation and then high flow nasal oxygen for apneic oxygenation? It's what we did in the Optimive study, and we found that it was a good method to add apneic oxygenation to the pre-oxygenation with non-invasive ventilation. As you can see here in the picture, the lowest SpO2 during intubation was higher in the group combining non-invasive ventilation and high-flow nasal oxygen. So of course, maybe not in all patients, but in selected high-risk population, predicted difficult intubation, very high risk of hypoxemia, we could use both to prevent hypoxemia. And uh, we have to remember that the best method to provide oxygen to the patient when he is in apnea is to perform mask ventilation. And it was shown in a very recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine, where the author were ventilating the patient during apnea. And what we can see is that the lowest arterial oxygen saturation during intubation was higher when ventilating the patient during apnea compared to no ventilation. Of course, the patient weren't at very high risk of aspiration, but it was rapid sequence induction and patient critically, critically ill patients. Then, to avoid both hypoxemia and severe collapse, the choice of drugs is very important in intubation. The most recent study on the subject was published this year in Intensive Care Medicine, and the author co compared ketamine and etomidat for emergency intubation. As you can see in the single center clinical trial, the probability of survival was significantly higher at day seven when using ketamine instead of etomidat, but not at day 20, 28. So it is encouraging results in favor of using ketamine and also etomidat because you can see no such difference when performing rapid sequence induction. So if you summarize the drugs for rapid sequence induction, the hypnotic, there are three possible. And the last one, propofol, recently shown in the postdoc analysis of the Intuc study that it was associated with a lot of hemodynamic compromise. So maybe, especially accepted in particular case, avoid propofol to perform rapid sequence induction and choose between ketamine and etomidat. Regarding the second drug of rapid sequence induction, neuromuscular blocker, we have two drugs at our disposal. First, succinylcholine, and then rocuronol. There are pros and cons, I, I let you read, but uh, overall, both drugs are very, very good drugs to perform neuromuscular blocking. And uh, in, especially in case of contraindication to succinylcholine, such as the risk of hyperkalemia, we can use also rocuronium, even if the onset is a little bit less rapid. So the golden rule for could be whatever the drug you choose, uh, don't forget that the critically ill patients are not patients from anesthesia and that um, you have to reduce, reduce the dose to avoid the severe collapse complication, especially if you choose to use propofol, which could be dangerous. Then to avoid hypoxemia, a first attempt success is very important as we shown in, uh, in this study. As you can see here, the percentage of hypoxemia is higher when you perform two attempts rather than one attempt, and even when you perform four attempts rather than three attempts. However, the percentage of several collapse is in change. So how to, deal, to increase first attempt success? First, be prepared for difficult intubation, so first attempt failure. And uh, we developed a score, the MACOCHA score, which can predict difficult intubation and which can be very quickly realized only opening the mouth. Just open the mouth of the patients and you can see a lot of items that are in this score, such as the malampathy score and the opening mouth. And also seek for an obstructive apnea syndrome if you have time, because it is also 
associated with difficult intubation. What about the use of video laryngoscope? We had first very encouraging results. The, this meta-analysis was published in 2014, and we found that the first attempt success was increased in ICU with video laryngoscope. But then we had this very nice large randomized control trial comparing video laryngoscopy and direct laryngoscopy, showing no difference between first attempt success in both groups. However, a little more complications in the group video laryngoscopy. One explanation is that 84% of operators were non-expert operators and uh, to, to be good at video laryngoscopy, it's better to be expert. So the golden rule six is to use the device you know the best. Don't start using video laryngoscope for the first time in ICU if you are untrained. And, um, and uh, this uh, recent study published in CCM in 2020 found that at least 15 video laryngoscopy using a Macintosh video laryngoscope are needed for obtaining the highest first attempt success. So they, they found this, this interesting threshold of 15 video laryngoscopy performed in the patient. However, since the COVID-19 pandemic, we are more and more used to uh, perform video laryngoscopy. So this study has to be done again with this new expertise that we have. And um, we recently um, did buy in the narrative review 10 tips to improve first attempt intubation success using video laryngoscope. First, the training of the operator, both in simulation and in the patient under a senior control. Then the choice of a single video laryngoscope device that all the team is used to, um, to, to utilize. Then, and finally, for unchanneled video laryngoscope, especially in critical inpatient where you don't have time, don't hesitate to put a stylet um, and or a bougie for this unchanneled video laryngoscope. And don't hesitate to allow easier intubation of the trachea to allow a suboptimal visualization of the glottis. Because uh, often you are too close of the glottis, so you can just remove a little the video laryngoscope suboptimal visualization and the intubation will be easier. If you choose to use direct laryngoscopy, it's possible if it's the, the device you know, you know the best. Uh, we, Thomas Godet and the, the, the team from Clermont-Ferrand and Samir Jaber recently found that using a Mac 3 blade could be better than using a Macintosh blade in laboratory and the increased first attempt success. In the stylet or randomized control trial, still using direct laryngoscopy, we compare a stylet in the tube with a, a tube alone without any stylet. And we found that the first inter attempt intubation success was increased in the group associating tracheal tube and stylet. And recently, the team of driver uh, recently published in JAMA a trial comparing stylet, as we saw, we, we saw before, and bougie for intubation using direct or video laryngoscopy and found no difference between the two devices. So the golden rule seven is to know very well your team airway management algorithm. We propose one thing, but you can adapt according uh, to uh, your own practice. To further avoid hypoxemia, maybe the most important message of this talk is to check tracheal tube position. And how to check tracheal tube position is to use capnography to check the tracheal tube position and a very, a very nice um, consortium publish guidelines to avoid esophageal intubation and uh, underline the use of capnography. The second aim of a successful intubation is to avoid severe collapse. So how to avoid severe collapse during intubation? We have to anticipate before intubation and to optimize hemodynamic management. So how to optimize? Professor Javert studied it in 2010 and um, performed a bundle including both fluid loading and vasopressor. 
And using the bundle, as you can see in the picture, there was a decrease in severe prolapse. Since there were two very nice multicenter randomized control trials, one comparing fluid loading alone versus no fluid loading and showing no difference between the two regarding the risk of cardiovascular prolapse. However, we can see a large heterogeneity according to the subgroups, and uh, some patients were excluded for hypovolemia, and fluid loading was assessed alone and not with vasopressin. Same remark for the recent trial of Russell et al. published this year in JAMA in 2020, again comparing fluid bolus, or fluid bolus alone and no fluid bolus, and overall there were no difference between them. So very nice studies are ongoing and we are waiting for these results about the association of fluid bolus and the systematic use of vasopressor, which could be the solution associated with the choice of drug to limit this occurrence of severe prolapse. So the golden rule 10 is, is that you can use an intubation bundle. And this is an example of what we use in Montpellier, pre-intubation two operators, Fluid loading associated with early introduction of vasopressor, preparation of long term sedation before the intubation, consider upright position for the pre oxygenation and further increasing the oxygen reserves. We already talked about the, pre -oxygen, the method of pre oxygenation. Per intubation, we advise first video laryngoscope and if not a reliable Macintosh laryngoscope with stile, a rapid sequence induction. Ventilation in case of elevated risk of desaturation higher than the risk of aspiration. And post intubation, capnography to check correct placement of the tube. The, the increase of vasopressor if needed. And then always check the cuff pressure and ensure a good and prudent and careful ventilation following the intubation. To conclude, here are the 10 golden rules for intubation in uh, ICU, and I remain at, uh, at your disposal to, to talk about it, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Go ahead. No, thank you, Andre. It was really clear and uh, really straightforward. I think we'll take questions for the discussion at the end, and so I will uh, let uh, Katia present uh, Professor Antonel. Thank you. So we move to the second presentation as uh, uh, we will keep all the questions and the comments uh, for the end. Massimo Antonelli is a professor of intensive care and anesthesiology in Rome, and he is the director of the Department of Emergency, Intensive Care Medicine and Anesthesiology at the Policlinico Gemelli uh, University Hospital in Rome and he is the director of the School of Specialty in Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine. He is one of the past president of ESICM and one of the past presidents of the Italian Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. His main fields of interest are sepsis, infection, and um, respiratory failure and mechanical ventilation. He will devote the next 15 minutes in um, telling us how to provide a safe and effective non-invasive ventilation. Professor Antonelli, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katia, for the presentation. Uh, I'm really honored to be uh, invited to present. And uh, uh, these are my conflict of interests. And um, uh, just behind what uh, um, Professor De Jong said, uh, one of the uh, things that is under the line is the experience. And you will see how the experience may be very important uh, for many different uh, conditions, including the non-invasive ventilation. Of course, recapitulating the entire uh, non-invasive ventilation feel is impossible 15 minutes. So I decided to take apart the um, application in COPD patient, which is very well established uh, and uh, suggested many guidelines. I want to focus on the acute hypoxemic patient. But I want to start with, with something that is not properly defined as non-invasive ventilation, the high flow oxygen therapy. Why? 
because indeed uh, the, I want to introduce the concept of safety and efficacy. And uh, what better than showing one, the application of this good, uh, um, the good index that is Bitcoin recently, and they put together the ratio, uh, ratio of pulse oximetry, FeO2 and respiratory rate. And what is uh, really interesting is how this author uh, has suggested uh, to stratify the population depending upon the severity of the score, considering various possible solutions uh, when these uh, thresholds were uh, achieved. However, moving to specifically the subject of my presentation, we have to consider that uh, when the new definition of the LDS uh, were uh, elaborated in the 2012, the role uh, devoted to the non-invasive ventilation and the high flow oxygen therapy were exclusively for the mild LDS, those whose PF was something in between 200 and 300. But as a matter of fact, you know that especially during the pandemic days, we have applied the non-invasive ventilation several times, also in patients who were more severe. However, looking at the guidelines that were published a few years ago, um, there were uh, some recommendations, but uh, when the question should be posed, if uh, the non-invasive ventilation should be used for the hypoxemic ARF, there was no recommendation. But in the justification, there were some uh, additional consideration that pertains uh, the, the uh, presentation of today. In other terms, there was not enough evidence to recommend the use to reduce mortality. But uh, in the justification, the author said a, a trial of need could be allowed and offered to the hypoxemic patient, a patient we kept or with an LDS, when there is an experienced clinical team. But you need to have also a careful patient, patient selection. And another concept is not only the monitoring of the ICU, but an early a repeated assessment. Uh, always keeping in mind that uh, the intubation should be promptly accomplished if the patients did not improve. But that the technique work also in the cost of, of the uh, hypoxemic patients is very well known. This is our uh, seminal study published many years ago uh, at, the end, at the beginning of the year 2000 and where we could show the uh, capability, effectiveness of improving the gas exchange being even impossible to distinguish looking at the first hour of application between those who were conventionally ventilated with endotracheal intubation from those who were ventilated non-invasively. And one of the main results, even though the numbers were, weren't uh, so huge uh, in the study was also the reduction, uh, significant reduction of the complication. Ewan a uh, few years later showed how the uh, combination of pressure support and PEEP could have uh, achieved the best uh, uh, results in terms of reduction of the transitive diaphragmatic pressure and reduction of the work of breathing. However, when we look at the application of spontaneous breathing and non-invasive uh, non uh, ventilation, we do have some problems because there is all the way, very often in these patients a deep inspiratory sw swing and high tidal, tidal volume, high transpulmonary pressure, which translate when you have an active breathing, when there is indeed an active contraction of the uh, inspiratory muscle and a deep swing, and increase the tidal volume. And this may be dangerous for these patients. But on top of that, we have to remind also the mechanism of bleeding that look at the, um, the transpulmonary uh, pressure, which is the difference between the airway pressure and the pleural pressure. And when you have a normal condition without any uh, intense swing, uh, inspiratory swing, you may get a pressure of minus five. And uh, in, in, as a total, you may have a transpulmonary pressure of 25. But what happens if the patient starts to, to breathe intensively, that uh, uh, the uh, inspiration swing may be very important and the negative pressure may be uh, much more, in this case, reaching uh, levels that can be dangerous for the patient. But at times, and this is another problem, 
the application of non-invasive ventilation may also reduce the effort of the inspiratory effort of the breathing. And in this case, the real possibility of a, a, a BD that develops uh, is indeed uh, interlocutory. Uh, one of the main problems is whether uh, related to the fact that uh, measuring the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure is almost impossible when you have uh, a patient's uh, spontaneous breathing with non-invasive ventilation. And also using the uh, esophageal balloon may be very useful, but not always clinically feasible at bedside. However, uh, in a, a la the larger <clears throat> observational study, the lung safe study showed, unfortunately, that for those patients who were more severe, the application of non-invasive ventilation was indeed um, accompanied by a higher mortality rate, uh, but irrespective to the category, the severity of the category. Of course, this was not a randomized trial, but the other uh, word of concern was also expressed by other groups stressing how delaying or postponing a necessary intubation may be equivalent to increase the uh, mortality rate. However, uh, the same group that uh, participated to the lung safe trial showed that the application of spontaneous bleeding, regardless the presence or not of the non-invasive ventilation, was indeed uh, uh, protective uh, by reducing mortality. So uh, there are lights and shadows that should be, of course, taken into consideration. But non-invasive ventilation for sure can be beneficial in this context, but requires a careful clinical judgment. We need to optimize the treatments, mitigate the lung injury, but also having an early detection treatment favor, avoiding any delay leading to the intubation. Uh, Guillaume Carteau, uh, in 2015 in clinical care medicine, uh, made a very interesting study where he could put in relationship the higher tidal volume expressed by some of the patients and the uh, higher percentage of failure. The, having uh, uh, the tidal volume uh, has a good predictor of the failure of non-invasive ventilation. If, in a, another observational study, uh, in the past, uh, in recent, relatively recent past, we could show how the higher severity of the patient, as well as the lack of improvement or, of PF after one hour, could have been also uh, good predictors of the failure. One of the most interesting study for applying a safe non-invasive ventilation and predicted uh, in the, its efficacy is just a combination of the heart rate, acidosis, consciousness, oxygenation, and respiratory rate. This uh, uh, group of uh, Chinese investigators coined the hardcore score and had a, a, a clear-cut threshold above which the possibility, the, just detecting this score after one hour of non-invasive ventilation, the probability of failure was quite high. And uh, also looking at the uh, intubation, early intubation, and late intubation, there were clear cut differences. This is just proposal, but how can just uh, uh, set, make the setting by using the fashion mask, uh, starting with a um, FeO2 between 0.3 and 5, and then titrating in order to obtain a saturation between 92 and 96. But uh, you can also increase gradually the PEEP not too much because otherwise you may generate an air leak, an air leak and the pressure support can be increased in order to keep the tidal volume within the six up to eight milliliters per, per kilogram and keeping low the respiratory rate. But obviously in the context of non-invasive ventilation also the interface counts and indeed uh, we could show uh, at the beginning of the of this century how the use of the, he the helmet could allow a better uh, in improvement of PF, but mostly by applying uh, a higher level of P. Uh, well, uh, our was an observational study. The first randomized tri uh, trial has been published into the JAMA by the group of John Cress, and where they could show that the probability of survival 
uh, was higher when the non-invasive ventilation was delivered through the helmet uh, respect to the face mask. And once again, what they could show that the level of the uh, was, uh, was higher, significantly higher through this device respect to the face mask. Uh, does it matter? Of course, yes, because we know that uh, when we look at the uh, uh, potentially recruitable lung, we have a low percentage of potentially recruitable lung and a higher percentage. And in this case, if you are capable to apply a non-invasive ventilation with higher level of feed, of course, not 45 centimeters of water, as is uh, depicted in this uh, slide, you can uh, achieve a better recruitment in for those patients who are open to it. To it. Very recently, during the pandemic, we have published uh, into the JAMA uh, a, a paper where we compare in the early phases of the acute respiratory failure, uh, the high flow nurses oxygen and the helmet non-invasive ventilation, looking at the day three, days three of respiratory support. And what we show that uh, there was no major difference in terms of the main endpoint the median respiratory support fee days. However, looking at the secondary endpoint, the number, number of uh, in the cumulative incidence of intubation was much lower when we used the helmet non-invasive pressure support in comparison to the high flow nasal oxygen. How to set the, uh, the set up the, uh, the helmet with non-invasive pressure support? We can just have people something in between 10 and 12, a pressure support very similar to that. When available, uh, the expiratory trigger can be adjusted something in between 10 and 50 percent, titrating the, the, uh, the FeO2 uh, depending upon the level of SpO2 that you can achieve. The inspiratory trigger uh, can be eventually increased to avoid the auto triggering, keeping uh, uh, ideally within the two liters per minute fastest uh, pressurization ramp is mandatory. The maximum inspiratory time when available can be changed. But of course, any in any form of non-invasive pressure support ventilation, you have to keep in mind a predefined criteria for the intubation. And when these criteria are present, you do not have to hesitate to intubate a patient. Worsening of, of, the, uh, of the dyspnea or uh, unchange of it the lack of improvement on gas change or the lack of improvement of signs of respiratory muscle fatigue or the presence of respiratory acidosis or a low uh, oxygen, peripheral oxygen saturation or the hemodynamic instability. All these things should be very uh, careful taken into consideration in order to avoid any postponement of the necessary intubation. We could also show, however, that when non-invasive ventilation through the helmet was applied in comparison to the helmet sit up, the uh, esophageal swing go uh, lower and the inspiratory effort, efforts are reduced as well as the reduction of the uh, pressure time product and consequently the work of breathing, which are my conclusion. The non-invasive ventilation indeed can be used safely in general for less hypoxemic patients. But a short trial, a short trial I recommend, uh, can be attempted for those patients whose PF is below 200. Um, in general, because these patients are hypoxemic and what is the best uh, determinant of the oxygenation is the mean airway pressure, um, a continuous treatment is needed uh, in alternative what happens for the COPD patients and the uh, PEEP must be adequate. However, never delay a necessary intubation if the PF ratio after one hour is between 130 and 170, if the tidal volume are higher, if the HACO score is below five, and especially when we have an increase of the SOFA score or the severity score depicted by SAPS2 uh, are indeed higher. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, clear, precise presentation. Very safe, I would say. Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't.
Yeah. Okay, yeah, we, we will move on to the next presenter. Sorry, I was disconnected. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Lavina Munchi, that I had uh, the great pleasure to meet when I was in Toronto. Lavina is an associate professor and intensive physician uh, in the University of Toronto. She works in clinical and research, uh, and her areas of interest include uh, RDS. Acute respiratory failure, mechanical ventilation, and critical care management of the patients with a cancer and immunosuppressed patients. And if I'm not wrong, she's still a fan of the Toronto Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Levina, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that kind um, introduction. And um, uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present this afternoon. Um, as mentioned, I'll be talking about quality indicators when providing mechanical ventilation and I have no relevant financial disclosures. So over the past few decades, we've seen that ICU use has rapidly increased with either advanced age, improved ICU care, and given that there's been a recent focus on delivery of high quality care in the ICU, and this high quality care was certainly put to the test during the most recent COVID-19 pandemic. Given the complexities of ICU organization and the high frequency of death, the ICU environment offers a unique opportunity for quality improvement and quality indices. When we think about quality in healthcare, it's essentially the degree to which health services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm very briefly gonna talk about quality indicators in the ICU. I will highlight some quality indicators that I feel are important for the delivery of effective mechanical ventilation, as well as our compliance of quality indicators based upon more epidemiologic data. And very briefly, I'll touch on some strategies to improve adherence, as well as some future opportunities. So when we reflect upon the purpose of a quality indicator in the ICU, it's essentially to improve delivery of patient care, enhance equity and access to care, and there also tends to be resource and economic implications. Steps of implementation science to enhance quality include defining that quality indicator, measuring the quality indicator, if there's a gap in care, discuss strategies to improve that quality indicator, and then measure effectiveness of that strategy. And when we think about quality indicators in the ICU, they may include improvement of hospital processes, such as compliance with low tidal volume ventilation or appropriate application of prone positioning, for example. Minimize adverse events, such as ventilator-associated pneumonias or self-extubation, or enhance health outcomes, such as duration of mechanical ventilation or ICU survival. And potential frameworks for domains of quality indicators in the ICU may include things like safe administration of care, such as central line bundles to minimize catheter-related bloodstream infections, for example. Effective execution of clinical practice guidelines or evidence-based medicine, such as enhancing compliance with low tidal volume ventilation, enhancing patient-centered care, such as speaking in patients that have a tracheostomy, timely delivery of care, such as time to antibiotics, for example, in the setting of septic shock, efficient execution of care, such as conducting your spontaneous breathing trial early enough in the morning so the result may be available at the time of morning rounds to make a decision about extubation and equitable access to care, for example, access to invasive mechanical ventilation during times of stress and strain. However, the delivery of a generalizable quality indicator in the ICU as a benchmark, for example, is not always easy. And there may be variability based upon location of the ICU and the size and structure and composition and staffing model, patient demographics and illness severity, continuing evolution of evidence-based practices, as well as challenges in standardizing measurements of quality indicators. So what are some examples of quality indicators for mechanical ventilation? I like to divide them up into those that are directly related to the mechanical ventilation, which could be addressed at the patient level or unit level, or indirectly related to mechanical ventilation, which may be once again addressed at the patient or unit level. Most of my time will be spent on patient-related direct mechanical ventilation quality indicators, and a lot of it also surrounds ARDS management. So the first quality indicator I want to highlight is the importance of identification of ARDS. As everyone is aware, ARDS is associated with a high mortality rate despite the major improvements in the care and the discoveries over the past few decades. And evidence-based practices reduce ARDS mortality. Therefore, identification of ARDS is essential to implementation of these practices. 
Now, according to the Lung Safe study, which was an international epidemiologic study of ARDS practices and identification, while that study did demonstrate that recognition of ARDS or the lack of recognition of ARDS did not really have an impact on tidal volumes delivered, what it did have an impact on was the adoption and use of evidence-based adjuncts for ARDS management with a greater proportion of patients receiving those adjuncts if they had ARDS recognized compared to those that did not have ARDS recognized. So given this, I feel that the identification of ARDS could be an important quality indicator. And I also understand that this definition may be evolving uh, more recently. The second or third quality indicators that I wanted to highlight is compliance with two strongly recommended evidence-based practices. I'll extrapolate these evidence-based practices from a series of clinical practice guidelines. This one, for example, was published in 2017, and I participated in this, endorsed by ATS, ESICM, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and led by Dr. Eddie Fan. Subsequently, in the two years that followed, in 2019, there were two further um, guidelines that were published by uh, Dr. Papazian and Dr. Griffiths, and they also included addressing a, a larger number of questions in the management of ARDS. But just to summarize a snapshot of those three guidelines, there were two strongly recommended practices. The first is pressure and volume limited ventilation, and the second was prone positioning across patients with moderate to severe ARDS. So given this, I feel that these two are important quality indicators in the mechanical ventilation in patients who present with ARDS. Now, the fourth quality indicator I wanted to highlight includes protocolized weaning. Now, prolonged weaning can take up about 50% of the time of a patient in the ICU. It's associated with worse morbidity, worse mortality, nosocomial infections, iatrogenic complications. And not only does prolonged weaning have implications to patient outcome, it also has economic and resource implications. The American College of Chest Physicians and the American Thoracic Society came up with clinical practice guidelines in 2017, and these were very effective to provide a lay of the land of the evidence, which was then incorporated into many weaning protocols, and it also identified all the gaps in uh, the literature currently to be a foundation for subsequent research, such as the Wean Safe study that Dr. Pham is involved in. Now, the ideal weaning process um, is open for debate, but when you look at the guidelines and you look at many evidence-based protocolized weaning processes that have been associated with some success, they tend to involve concepts such as minimization of sedation, minimization of excess fluids, daily ventilator goals or titration by respiratory therapist if they actually work in your ICU, and in particular, criteria to screen for and initiate spontaneous breathing trials. So given their success in minimizing time on mechanical ventilation, I think this is also an important quality indicator. Now, switching to unit level quality indicator metrics, these are essentially things that may be unit structure associated, such as equitable access to invasive mechanical ventilation, intensivist to patient staffing ratio, nursing ratios, the presence of respiratory therapists and the number in closed ICUs, or these may be outcome measures, such as duration of mechanical ventilation, extubation failure rates, self-extubations, ICU length of stays, ICU mortality, or patient and family satisfaction. And this is just a snapshot of the range and different time points across mechanical ventilation for which you could potentially implement quality indicators. And these are examples of direct ones in green where the patient related and blue where the unit related. Now turning your attention to indirectly related to mechanical ventilation, these are essentially any sort of intervention that would minimize duration of mechanical ventilation by preventing nosocomial associated complications and enhancing recovery. At the patient level, these may include infection prevention, whether it be stewardship, ventilator associated pneumonia prevention bundles, times to antibiotics, sedation protocols, et cetera, or these may be at the unit level, once again, focused on global approaches to infection prevention, family meetings to ensure that goal concordant care continues to be delivered, number of physiotherapists to promote rehabilitation, presence of pharmacists on rounds, and equitable and timely access to not just ICU care, but also invasive mechanical ventilation. And once again, this is summarized again in the orange patient level indirect factors that may impact quality of mechanical ventilation and unit level indirect factors in the pink. Now, when we think about quality indicators, it doesn't solely focus around adoption of evidence-based practices. There's also de-adoption of practices that are no longer evidence-based, unnecessary, or maybe associated with high resource or economic implications. And these may include 
routine use of chest x-rays, routine use of inhaled nitric oxide on all patients with moderate to severe AODS, routine use of high frequency oscillation on all patients with moderate to severe AODS, as well as the routine use of recruitment maneuvers on all patients with moderate to severe AODS. So this is not to say that they certainly don't have a role, but the routine use and using these as quality metrics are probably not useful. Now, now that we have a sense of what quality indicators may be useful, what is our compliance with these quality indicators? And it's very important to highlight that these are very unit dependent and my snapshot of compliance are being derived from larger epidemiologic studies. So when we look at the lung safe study once again, and we look at compliance with, lung pr with um, identification of acute respiratory distress syndrome, by the end of the study period, only 51% of patients with mild ARDS were identified as having mild ARDS and 79% of those with severe ARDS. At the time of fulfillment of criteria, the ARDS identification was only seen in 34% of patients. When we reflect upon compliance with low tidal vol volume ventilation and limitations of pressures, ideally we want patients in the range of tidal volumes less than eight cc's per kilogram and plateau pressures less than 30. On the x-axis from the lung safe study, we have tidal volumes and y-axis we have plateau pressures. Ideally, everyone would be in this left lower quadrant. However, 35% received tidal volumes of more than eight cc's per kilogram. When we reflect upon prone positioning, once again, from the LUNSAFE study, when they evaluated adjuncts and patients with severe ARDS, only 16% of those patients received prone positioning. It is important to highlight once again, that there is variation between centers in the early management practices of um, adjuncts to mechanical ventilation, as well as compliance with evidence-based practices, as was nicely demonstrated in this recent observational study published by Nita Kadir, which looked at variation in management across about 42 centers in the United States. The other thing that's important to highlight is that the COVID-19 pandemic has probably had a major impact in adoption of certain evidence-based mechanical ventilation quality metrics. And different from the lung safe study, which occurred many years prior, in this recent observational study by Chelsea Johnson and Alan Walkie, they evaluated compliance with evidence-based guideline care, including compliance with low tidal volume ventilation, plateau pressure limitations, and the um, initiation of prone positioning in patients with a PF ratio less than 100, and patients with COVID ARDS, and they found higher compliance than that was what was seen during previous observational studies. Now, turning to compliance with weaning and liberation, most recently, Karen Burns and the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group published an international study evaluating variability across weaning and discontinuation practices for critically ill patients. And not surprisingly, there was great variability in screening and conducting spontaneous breathing trials, um, written directives surrounding adjusting ventilator settings and sedation and sedation interruption. Now, very briefly, what are strategies we may have to improve adherence to quality indicators? And I'm not an implementation scientist, so I'll highlight some interesting and important facts that I learned from my colleagues in implementation science. So you've identified that there is a problem. The next important question is, can you actually measure it? Are you measuring your QI indicator? Once again, this is very unit specific based upon where the gaps in care are. Are. You have to decide what to measure, how to measure, prospective tends to be better than retrospective data, computerized tends to be better than human collected, but we need to recognize that existing data often are from narrow subsets of patients from high income healthcare communities that may not be generalizable and different institutions will have different priorities and challenges when it comes to measurement. And how do you initiate change? In this beautiful um, essay on evolution of human factors in healthcare, they highlight this hierarchy of intervention effectiveness, ranging from people-focused to system-focused intervention effectiveness. People-focused interventions may be education and training, rules and policies, reminders and checklists. They tend to be very effective when there's a large gap in care. If you enter a unit and no one is compliant with prone positioning, they're easier to implement and they're focused on changing behavior. And overall, however, in the hierarchy, relatively less effective than system-focused. System focus may be standardization. So for example, in our city, we have a standardized spontaneous breathing uh, trial protocol across all of our units. Automation, computerization. When someone is mechanically ventilated, we have pre-printed or pre-established order sets for VAT prevention vendors. We make it as simple as possible. It's more effective than people focused in isolation, but ultimately it's the combination of these interventions that are ideal. So very briefly, future opportunities. So I think the bottom line is we need to keep up with the evolution of the evidence 
ESICM mechanical ventilation AODS guidelines will be coming out soon, as well as an update in the ATS clinical practice guidelines. The Wien Safe study, we'll hear more from Tai Pham on this, uh, uh, I think likely at the end of the year. And then finally, we need to engage the right stakeholders, which now also include patients and families. And with this increased focus on personalized medicine for mechanical ventilation, we may start to encounter some challenges in our ability to develop very generalizable processes of care quality metrics. Additionally, international registries to act as benchmarks for quality of care are a very hot topic, and they probably have a major role in enhancing quality of care in the ICU. So in conclusion, when we reflect upon quality indicators, we have process of care, adverse events, and health outcomes we need to reflect upon. There were many different quality indicators for mechanical ventilation. I highlighted a few that I thought, thought reflected evidence-based practice. You need to reflect upon what is your compliance. This is gonna be unit specific. And overall, according to epidemiologic data, there are areas for improvement and the pandemic might have led to greater adoption of some of these. Are you measuring your quality indicators? And when initiating change, you may wanna reflect upon system focused interventions. And finally, there's lots of future opportunities to enhance this area and conduct more research. So thank you for uh, listening and thank you once again for the invitation. Thank you, Lavina. It was really a great presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you to the three speakers uh, for what the time and the efforts they devoted uh, to present us uh, their thoughts uh, and beliefs. We might start uh, with some of the questions that we have received from uh, the audience. Tai, would you mind start with the first one? Yeah, the first question was for Audrey. And uh, they are knowing that it takes probably two to three respiratory cycles to have a CO2 capnography. What is your opinion about using the expiratory flow on the ventilator as a marker of successful tracheal intubation? Yes, thank you for your question. This is a very good uh, question from a physiological point of view. Uh, however, the capnography is a very simple way for everybody, even the young residents, to be sure that uh, the tracheal tube is in the good position. And using expiratory flow is more complicate. complicated. You need a very good knowledge of the flow, especially when uh, you perform an esophageal intubation at the beginning. It could be very confusing with a tracheal tube uh, position. So maybe for everybody, capnography is easier and uh, more safe, but you can also look at expiratory flow and it's a very good point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. So and we go to Massimo now. And uh, um, one of the audience ask, uh, would like to ask you, how much pressure support can we consider safe when it comes to pleural pressure swings? You might switch on the audio, Massimo, please, sorry. Sorry, it was my fault. Uh, indeed, that is a very good question. Uh, and uh, the answer, we should try to personalize depending upon the response to the uh, pressure support on part of the patient. If you see, uh, as I try to explain, uh, looking at the data showed by the uh, Laurent Bouchard group, that if you increase the tidal volume, for example, maybe an indirect indicator of an excessive effort on part of the patient, and you may assume that probably the transpulmonary pressure may be higher. And under these circumstances, maybe could be wiser or to intubate the patient or see if it is compatible, the reduction of the pressure support. But indeed, we don't, not, don't have a magic number or a magic uh, indicator that gives us the certainty. Of course, having the esophageal balloon, we can ask, uh, can help us a lot because it gives a, a, a clear cut uh, indicator of the inspiratory effort. And under these circumstances, you may titrate the level of pressure support depending upon uh, the, uh, the effort of the patient. Always, this must be com clinically compatible because if I have to reduce the pressure support and this increase the, the dyspnea or the uh, tachypnea, of course, this is something wrong. And in this case, once again, do not hesitate to intubate. And 
speaking of, of, of the fog of pressure during uh, non invasive ventilation, don't you have more leaks when, when you try to assess your uh, uh, your uh, transpulmonary pressure with a patient uh, under non invasive yes, ventilation? Yeah. Yes, indeed, but it depends on the kind of device you are adopting. This is uh, uh, absolutely true with the facial mask, also because we cannot do what you do uh, usually with the normal NG tube. You can cut it and then uh, just uh, connect the two uh, extremities for, through a, a simple connector. This cannot be done with a, a esophageal balloon catheter because otherwise you compromise the efficiency of the balloon. Uh, and then uh, uh, in, under these circumstances, maybe the best way is once again to use the helmet where the amount of leaks is negligible and you have a different physiology because you act in a, a pressurized environment uh, uh, during the entire cycle. And even though you have the emergence uh, of the NG tube, but we can do that uh, even by using, in case of the helmet, the um, just uh, uh, seal connector of the helmet, just continuing the ventilation. But it means that you need to perform a special technique inserting through the, this passage, the NG tube and uh, the esophageal balloon, and then into the nostrils and into the esophageal uh, tract of the patient. It's a bit Thank tricky. You. Thank you, Mr. Mark. And I think the next question uh, can be asked to all the presenters. And we're again talking of a magical number, as you uh, mentioned, for the uh, transpulmonary pressure. And uh, the audience is asking is there a, any PCO2 level that you can allow for permissive hypercapnia? Oh. <laughs> uh, Audrey, when you, when you start? So yes, yes. How high would you consider safe? <laughs> oh. I think it's difficult. It depends on the on the patient, on the pathology. But uh, overall, I, I would say 50, 55. I don't know what do you, what do you think the the over? I guess that uh, the most important things under these circumstances is also the pH level. It depends on how acidotic the patient is. If it is a, a, a severe acidosis, then the story is different and it cannot be safe especially when we are speaking about hypoxemic patient. The acute exacerbation of COPD is another story because uh, for these patients, uh, they are capable to tolerate higher level of PACO2. Uh, and then you can even disconnect the patient for a while allowing the feeding, for instance, the normal feeding. And it doesn't cause uh, after the initial improvement, major uh, detrimental effects. But this is a different story, a different kind of patient. Similarly, for, for us, we, we, we don't actually have a PCO2 number uh, or target in, in mind. We usually just titrate it to pH outside of um, any sort of neurologic injury. May I ask a question? Is it allowed for the speakers to ask a question? Yes, of course. OK, uh, I want to ask uh, Lavina, what, the, what do, do she, uh, <laughs> you think about the universal applicability of the quality indicator. For instance, in the low and middle income countries where the situations are quite different, at least you can use only part of the issues you have shown, I guess. What is your opinion? Because, you know, I remember always, uh, sorry for uh, I mean, interrupt you, uh, the best, uh, one of the best sentence of Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt, who said, do the best you can uh, with what you have in the place you are. So I completely agree with that statement. And it also goes back to um, Audrey's comment when she was describing the study of um, intubation techniques and which is the best intubation techniques. And ultimately, it does depend upon what do you what do you have access to and what are you most familiar with. So I think that's very important and applicable to uh, the interpretation of any sort of evidence surrounding quality indicators. Um, there's lots of differences in resources as well as differences in what your goals yeah. may be. I think there's certain quality metrics that can be more globally applicable, such as hand hygiene, for example. But there's yeah. there, there are others where it really does depend upon not just the unit characteristics, the staffing ratios, 
but also the patient population. And I think as we move more and more towards personalized medicine, even when it comes to deciding which non-invasive oxygen strategy to use, more and more we're learning there's not one size fits all for all patients. And so we have to start moving away for certain interventions to this global approach to one condition. Um, so I think that becomes important with um, quality research, uh, understanding the location, the population, as well as the resources and ensuring that you're matching the appropriate indicator to what's relevant to the unit at hand. Thank you. And with these words of wisdom, I think it's time for us to wrap up because uh, we are a little bit behind, but I think it's still okay. Thank you, each, each of you, because you uh, made great presentation. It was a great pleasure to watch this presentation and to uh, co-moderate this session with uh, you, Katya. Thank you very much. Thanks to you all. It was a pleasure, really a pleasure. And I would like to thank ESICM for uh, permitting us uh, to be all together this afternoon here with the support uh, of Mindray. Uh, this was uh, uh, again uh, possible. So thank you everybody and thank you to the audience uh, that uh, has been with us uh, all this hour. Thank you and see you soon and keep safe.